Hello and welcome to the Marina Skewer podcast. My name is Marina and I am coming to you from my little home studio in Bath in the southwest of England. We live on top of a hill and have recently been absolutely battered by storms. I don't know if other people in Europe are experiencing the same thing, but definitely in the UK it's rubbish at the moment. Um, the fact that we're on a hill means that we don't get the flooding that people in lower areas have had, but it does mean that we get the full force of the wind and we've lost quite a few fence panels in the garden. Um, which, if you've been watching for a while, you will know that I've been putting quite a lot of work into and so it's really sad to see some of our plants just completely crushed. But this is not a gardening podcast, it is mostly about yarn and knitting and I have a load of projects to share with you today and I'm really excited because I've I, I'm very, very busy at the moment, which is great. I've got shows to prepare for. I'm going on a trip soon and it's all very exciting. And as well as knitting being my work, I do use it to calm my nerves a bit. And when I'm stressed out, I tend to fill every moment I can with knitting um, just to kind of decompress. Um, and one of the other things that I've been doing is a lot of pasta making. I know that quite a few of you have enjoyed the videos I've done both a few episodes ago and on my Instagram stories. I've been making a lot of handmade pasta and so I'm going to be doing a little bit of that later on. Um, yes, a note before I carry on, I'm trying various new camera settings and I've recently switched software. Um, so, you know, just a little note that I'd love to hear what you think if you think the like any of the autofocus and stuff is distracting or if you think it's working well um, I know that generally you don't pay attention to the technical aspects of things but I really am trying to make nice quality videos for you and I would love any feedback on that so without any further ado I am going to get started with Finished objects, I'm going to do finished objects first. Um, I do not know what order to do them in. Okay, first hat, because you've seen this one uh, quite a few times before. This one is my contorta hat, which is from issue two of Making Stories. Um, if I try it on here, you can see it fits nicely. It's a tiny bit loose around the brim, um, but that's fine because as my hair's getting longer I tend to do more stuff here um, which tends to hold it on really nicely and it means that it does sink right down over my ears which I love because I really like to be warm enough. Um, and so it's great because it's a more lightweight one than a lot of my hats. Um, and I really really love this stitch pattern which is designed to look like a contorta pine. i take it off again, I can show you the decreases at the crown because that is just so satisfying. I love little details like that and like really strong converging lines is, is just so visually satisfying. Um, so I love this project. This is um, knit in my Mend It Four Ply yarn, which is what the pattern's written for. Um, the colour I've used is a naturally dyed um, colour with dandelions from my garden. Um, so yes, I highly recommend this pattern. It did take me rather longer than it should have done to get it finished because I started it I think in October and it took me way too long and it's just because of all these tiny cables and I have, like I'm learning a lot about myself as a knitter. Um, and I just, I don't like tiny cables. I really, really don't. I like I like crossed stitches where you can just work it all on the needles without having to transfer any stitches. Um, but yeah, tiny cables, not for me. I'm, I'm not gonna write them off entirely, but I'm definitely not going to be doing them on projects for a while. Um, the next thing is another project you will have seen last time. These were just little cuffs. And now they are fully fledged fingerless mittens. I'll put those on for you. There we go. 
and so these are I released the pattern just this week um, I've designed them so that you have full use of your hands while you're wearing them because I wear a lot of like proper mittens um, which are useless for you know having to do phone stuff and move around and things and sometimes you do need to use your hands um, when you're out and about and these are perfect for layering um, so they just tuck nicely into the cuffs of my coat and yeah they're wonderful and they're really really soft I I love them I'm very very pleased with them they've just got a nice little lace detail on the back of the hand there um, they're quite a simple construction. And when I started knitting quite a long time ago, I never expected to be knitting this fine. Because, um, I mean, that is... There we go. Um, that's 34 stitches to 10 centimetres. Um, which is just... I'm so pleased with myself because I, I always thought I would never have patience for tiny needles so I've done these on 2.5 millimeter needles and the yarn is my Kaya Baby Alpaca which I've just released a load of new colors in. Um, this color is called Pandora. All of the colors are named after women from classical mythology so Pandora was the first human female uh, who released all the evils into the world from a mysterious box which she was not meant to touch but she didn't know what was in there and she wanted to know and unwittingly you know imposed pestilence on the world um, so that in the skein looks like that and you can see I've got my new labels and you know I'm not a graphic designer but I do like doing little illustrations and I just really like this alpaca. This is actually a drawing of one of the alpacas from the farm where I get the fibre from. And so if I show you, I'm just going to hold these up in a whole big armful. Right. There we go. Oh my goodness. Um, can I get it so you can see them all? And so... Oh my god, it's like the weirdest bouquet ever. What if I do this? So yeah, lots and lots of fairly moody colours. I like how moody they are. Um, there are little pops of brighter colours, like this blue. This one's called Thetis, who was a... Uh, what was she? She was a sea nymph. Um, she was the mother of Achilles. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the names um, but if you are interested in them, each colourway on the website has a little explanation of who the colourway is named after. Um, so yes, love these. They're utterly... I don't know what the word I was going for there is. Um, no, I'm really pleased with them. They have lovely texture. They're very soft and very fine. Um, but they've got this, like, fuzzy halo. Um, which isn't like a cloudy halo like you get on Suri Alpaca or Mohair. It's more of a sort of, I don't want to say spiky halo because that sounds not soft and really aggressive. But you can see just little individual hairs of the alpaca just poking out of it, um, which I really, really love. And so yes, the mitts are the Winsome Mitts and they are on Ravelry now. I've realised I don't talk a lot about the origins of a lot of my pattern names. Um, I do occasionally mention it but um, these ones are called Winsome which is an old English word. It's spelled W-Y-N-S-U-M um, and it just means joyous or delightful because that was my experience knitting them. And it gives us the modern day word winsome, which is spelled completely differently, but means the same thing. And I just really enjoy those little bits of etymology. Um, so yes, that is those ones. 
next thing. Now these were a super quick project. Um, got a pair of more hand warmers. These ones are proper mittens. Um, I've made them convertible. So we've got flaps to go over my hands. There's a little um, thumb hole there. I'm going to actually put a couple of extra stitches in just to keep that closed a bit better because my thumb does like to escape slightly there. Um, but these are knitted in naturally coloured Shetland. Um, the fibre was a, a little sampler box of naturally coloured Shetland tops, which my cousin gave to me a few years ago, and it was very, very thoughtful. Um, I spun it into a roughly Aran weight yarn. I've knitted these up on a 4.5 millimeter needle, so four, four millimeters for the ribbing. So I've got ribbing at the cuffs and here on the hand and on the little flappy boy there. Um, and what I did is I knitted them. I do this fairly frequently with chunkier knits because when you knit with chunkier yarn, as well as the fabric being thicker than with a lighter weight yarn, the holes between the yarn are bigger. And so it means that they can often be, yes, very warm, but not very windproof. So if you've got a lot of wind, it'll get through all the holes anyway. And so I like to knit them slightly bigger than I eventually want them to be. And then when I'm soaking them, um, instead of just gently pushing them under the water and then soaking them for a while and then laying them out carefully to dry, I beat them up a bit. I, you know, I'll, when they're in the water, I will just rub them like this. And I don't use any detergent or anything when I'm blocking things um, because I generally find it's not necessary. Um, and I just do that and it, causes all of the fibres to mesh together a bit. It's not proper felting, but it's on the way. Um, and doing it by hand, I mean, you can do that by chucking it in the washing machine and having a really nice dense felt. Um, but this way you get to control exactly the finished size of the item. So these fit me fairly perfectly, which is fortunate because I have made them so that I have warm, warm hands on a trip I am doing to Norway next week which is really very exciting. I've wanted to go to Norway since I was tiny. Um, I, I'm very looking forward to hopefully getting some snow, um, spending a lot of time outside and with some dear, dear friends. Um, it's, it's just going to be amazing. Uh, I'm going to put some details of that below because it's in collaboration with a knitting festival in Norway, um, in Trondheim, well, just near Trondheim. And yes, there is going to be an afternoon tea party on the Sunday where if you happen to be in or near Trondheim, you can come along and meet us and we'll chat and it'll be really nice because I love to meet new knitters. Um, so yes, warm mittens for Trondheim. Which brings me on to the next one, which is a work in progress. Um, I am making some leggings. Um, I'm holding two yarns together. So I am making these out of um, Roma Finnel gun, which I'm probably saying horribly. I'm probably going to have to brush up on some Norwegian. <laughs> Um, so I have these colours as well as um, the dark grey there. Ah, oh good lord, is this going to work? Here we go. Yeah, that's fine. On for the yarn. Um, so I have these colours. It was completely coincidental that I already had one, two, three balls of this yarn. And then my dear friend Hannah Lisa was doing a bit of a de stash, and she happened to have the other colours, which tone in so perfectly. And so I'm very excited because it means I have enough for a decent project. So I am holding them together with this um, 
it's worsted spun lamb's wool it's actually i bought it as a single on cones i have quite a few kilos of it because i use it for weaving um and i've plied it together um so I, i've plied two strands together to make it a two ply or a twofold um, and i'm just holding that together with the roma and that will give me a roughly dk weight yarn um, so this is just waist ribbing. I was looking at patterns. I was I was planning on probably following a pattern. I was maybe going to buy um, a pattern called Callaloch by Andrea Wrangle. And yes, I was going to buy that. And then it's just because the fit looks astounding. Like if you want a properly amazing fitting pair of leggings it looks like that is the way to go however looking at them there's a lot of stitch patterning going on um there are cables in it and i'm really not up for doing cables for these and i'm going to be i'm already marling the yarn and then i'll be fading from one color to another as i go through which means that it's going to be quite a busy thing anyway so i really don't want any interesting stitch patterns going on so I'm I'm just sort of going for it I'm using I'm gonna go down to about upper hip these are gonna sit really high on my waist I've got elastic uh, really quite hefty elastic um, for the waistband so this will become the waistband and then I will fold it over and enclose it I had intended to do a provisional cast on so that I can then knit the stitches together to double it over so you end up with a really nice neat finish rather than having to seam the waistband. Um, I didn't do that because I forgot and so I will either, I'll see when I get to it how it's looking, I can probably pick up stitches along my cast on. Um, if that doesn't look like it's going to work I can seam it just with a like surface crochet chain. Uh, which should give a really nice stretchy finish, so that should work fine. Um, so yes, leggings, very excited about these. Uh, I've been wanting some knitted leggings for ages because I have very, very spindly legs and they get really cold. So that will be excellent for layering up and super warms. Um, I'm not expecting to finish them before I go, but it'll be fun to work on them while I'm there, especially as it'll be quite mindless knitting. Um, another project I am taking with me it is a pair of socks. So these ones are, I just love this colour, it's so orange and brilliant. Um, the yarn is Woolly Mammoth Fibres Natural Sock. Um, I've met Emma a couple of times and she is an absolute delight and I've been wanting to try her natural sock for ages and ages as part of my ongoing I want to try out as many natural sock yarns as I can. Um, this is just a little design I'm coming up with. I'll be working on these uh, in Norway as well uh, because I want to make sure that I've got a couple of projects with me that'll be easier to, easy to carry around. Um, and yet so far I'm really loving this yarn. It's sort of quite sturdy feeling. It's got a tiny bit of fuzz to it but also really nice stitch definition. Um, so yeah, I am super pleased with it. I am just trying to remember the fibre. It's definitely got a decent amount of chivia to knit, uh, but I'll put the info just in the description below. Um, I also have some other yarn from Emma, um, which she sent me as a thank you for recommending the mill that I used to her because she was asking around and I recommended um, curlew spinners in Wales um, which is just a tiny artisan mill and they spin up my Mendip yarns um, and so Emma sent me this skein of Jacobs as a thank you for recommending the mill and it's just so beautiful like it's it's got amazing texture to it um, real depth of shade it's got a lot of because it's Jacobs therefore it's quite a few shades of wool all blended together um, it has a really nice heathery effect and it's 
it's sort of fairly rustic feeling, um, but not scratchy or anything. But then I have quite high tolerance for these things. Um, and the most beautiful label. Um, I'm, I've got slight label envy. Um, but yes, I can't wait to work out what I do with this um, because it's just so gorgeous. And then another swap I did, because I did send Emma a couple of my naturally dyed skeins as well, um, which is slightly intimidating because she is a much better natural dyer than I am. Um, another naturally dyed skein of natural sock yarn um, is this one, which I received from Annabelle Williams, who is Annabelle Textiles. Um, she is based in Bristol um, and again is a natural dyer who does as much as possible locally sourced and organic um, wool and this wool is actually from the same farm as my Mendip yarn but she has specifically selected long staple Romney um, and had it spun up at a high twist into a sock yarn, which is utterly gorgeous. This colour isn't coming across properly on the camera. It's really, really like warm. It's like a peridot green. It's amazing. Um, and it's called Green Green Grass and it's utterly beautiful. And I think she's going to be having a new batch of that coming out in the upcoming months. So do keep an eye out on that um, because her yarns are beautiful and just all of her colours are right on point. Um, then, final project. <laughs> My goodness, I'm getting through them. Um, this one, if you've been watching previously, you will have seen before. Um, this was just a yoke last time, but now ugh, it is almost a like, short sleeve jumper. Um, I've reached the colour work at the bottom as you can just see, I've got a few rows there, and this is Ben's Christmas jumper, my husband. Um, I always get tempted to call him Mr. Skewer, but like Skewer isn't my name. He doesn't have the same name as me anyway, and the title Mr. is not his title, so none of it applies, <laughs> so he is not Mr. Skewer. Um, this is just Ben's jumper. And I keep telling him that if it were for me, it would be finished already because he is much, much bigger than me. Um, but I'm so pleased with the way these colours are working together and how the colour work has fitted. I've got a fair bit more to go and then I'll do the hem ribbing, ribbing and then I'll do the sleeves. And yeah, on it goes. I have to have it finished by the end of March because I'm doing it as part of the Out of the Dark Make Along, which is still running until the very end of March, at which point the clocks will have changed, we will have more light in the daytime, and loads of stuff will be happening in the garden, and I will be much happier with the world. Um, yeah, those are all the works in progress. I'm being quite frenetic today. I'm drinking a lot of coffee at the moment and I'm going to shush and do a bit of knitting with you now. So if you've been watching the podcast for a while, um, you probably will have seen my knitting technique change quite a bit because I think I've been doing Continental the whole time I've been recording the podcast. I, I think I switched earlier that year. Because I used to be exclusively an English style knitter, so holding the yarn in my right hand. And because I get wrist pain, um, I have to be very careful about the kind of movements I'm doing. Um, I have to look after my joints a fair bit because I have a few problems there. Uh, so after being completely unable to knit for a few weeks, which as someone who does knitting 
for that work is a bit of a struggle. Um, I switched to Continental and it took me a while to get used to it. Um, as you'll know, if you've tried to change up the way you do something that you can claim a level of proficiency at, if, for example, you start writing with your non-dominant hand, it can be very frustrating. And if you stick with it through, you know, perseverance and determination, you can get just as good with the other one. Um, a girl I went to school with had an enormous amount of problems with her... I can't remember if she was right-handed or left-handed, but she had a lot of problems with her dominant hand. Um, and so frequently had to write left-handed for school. And that meant that after a, probably a couple of years of ongoing problems, uh, she had two different handwritings because she could write just as capably in both hands. But the different style and everything, um, just the way you hold the pen and the angle that you approach the letters from, meant that she could write just as well in both, but they didn't look like they were written by the same person, which was just always very interesting to me. Um, complete side note. Um, but it means that having knitted English for most of my knitting career, if we can call it that, most of my knitting life, um, I then switched a couple of years ago to Knitting Continental. And for a while when I was doing colour work, I had so many problems with um, the way I was doing English that I couldn't do two-handed as I am now. I used a Norwegian knitting thimble, um, which I really enjoyed. I find it quite nice and speedy, um, and it does mean that I can knit for a bit longer when I'm doing colour work. Um, but I was finding that I had tension problems, in that you're using you can't tension the yarn separately because you're sort of using the same finger to tension. And so I, in some areas I was ending up with quite loose floats and in some fairly tight ones. And so I eventually tweaked, I can't, I can't even remember how I used to knit English style. Like it's, it, the technique has gone entirely. Um, but I changed how I do it to minimize because I was, I was doing a motion like that, which went right down into here and eventually up into my elbow. And that was not great. And so now by minimizing the flexion of my hand and fingers, um, I can do English a lot more easily. And it just took a while to have that be have English be a style that was less comfortable to me than Continental, then I could sort of overhaul it. And so now I can do both simultaneously for colour work like this. I can tension my yarns individually. Um, I'd say I'm getting fairly even floats there. I do like to keep my floats nice and loose so you have a lot of stretch in the fabric. Um, and yes, it's it means that I really enjoy colour work a lot more than I used to. I find it quite therapeutic and relaxing um, and because I'm quite visual I find it very easy to keep track of, um, especially at a heavier gauge like this, because this is DK weight yarn. Um, it's my Mendip DK yarn. So the grey is the naturally undyed grey. So it's a blend of light and dark lamb's wool. And the blue is a colour called Sky. 
which is dyed on that grey base. Um, and with a slightly heavier yarn like this, I find it really nice and easy to keep track because you're working the stitches in accordance with how they've been worked before. And the way I tend to design colour work um, is that I always try to minimise the length of floats. I generally prefer not to go above seven stitches in one colour in a row. Um, and so I think I probably have a fairly specific aesthetic for the way I do colour work, um, for the way I design colour work, uh, because I like diagonal lines. I like patterns that are intuitive to knit so that you can follow them sort of visually so you've got lines that continue and colours that overlap from the previous row and it makes them fairly easy to memorise. I tend not to do really big motifs um, and it's nice because it means that I get to do exactly the kind of colour work I enjoy. Um, Having said that, I'm almost making a lot of mistakes here and catching myself just in time. But take that as the fact that I am chatting at the same time as knitting. And I can do very silly things when I'm not concentrating. But yes, I'd love to hear about your knitting style, whether you're an English style knitter, a continental style knitter, if you have your own thing going on. Um, I find it really interesting um, and it's always fascinating to watch videos of people knit um, to me, which I, I hope you find that interesting here. Um, and that is my end of round marker there. I don't use stitch markers usually, I just use a little piece of scrap yarn tied into a loop um, and that means I have infinite stitch markers because I have more scrap yarn than I will possibly ever use um, and it means that it doesn't matter particularly if I lose them um, which as a result means I have stitch markers all over the house. <laughs> um, but yes, so I will be carrying on with this. I will probably be knitting on this jumper at Unravel. Um, probably not during busy times, but if it's quieter earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon, I'll have this with me. Um, if you are coming to Unravel, please do come by and say hello. It is going to be very exciting. I have been to Unravel a few times before and I really enjoy the show. It's a lovely venue. Um, I used to live very nearby there and I used to go to the Maltings for workshops. Um, and so it will be very nice this time to be exhibiting. And so if you do come by, if you want to have a look at this in person, then please ask and I will have it with me even if I'm not actively knitting on it. And if not, then I will be keeping you up to date with it on the podcast. Um, and eventually, somewhere down the line, I will be releasing this pattern. So a few months ago now, I think it was November, possibly episode 15, 16, somewhere around there, I did a video on how I make tortellini. At that stage I had very recently got into pasta making um, and I have been going fairly solidly ever since. 
I'm making fresh pasta approximately two or three times a week at the moment. Um, and I tend to make two different types. One is the egg pasta, which I made in that video, which is really good for uh, shapes where they're going through the pasta machine. Um, then there is a water pasta, which I make with semolina rather than pasta flour. Um, and that is what I'm going to be doing today. And that's much better for handmade shapes um, where you're not rolling it out really thin. And so today I'm going to be making gnocchi and yeah, I'll tell you what I'm doing as I go. So here I have all the things I'm going to need to make my semolina pasta. So I have semolina. Um, I use half a packet each time, which is a perfect amount for Ben and me. And that usually allows a little bit left over for my lunch the next day. So that is 250 grams. And in this jug here, I have warm water. I have 125 milliliters. So it's half the weight of the amount of semolina, which is really nice and easy to remember. Um, and then I'm just going to Throw in some salt there, a fair bit of salt, and a little splash of oil. And I'm just going to mix those up. They don't need to be mixed particularly well because they'll all get mixed together when they are made into dough. Just taking the scales out there and then I've made a little well in the semolina here. I don't know if you can see but it's quite coarse. Um, so it's, it's almost like a sandy texture, it's not particularly fine um, and I always thought that you needed really a, a fine milled grain for pasta making but this it soaks up all of the water and when you leave it to rest before you make the shapes it um, it comes into a really nice smooth consistency so it does not matter if you don't have fine semolina. So just put all of that in there and this one's really simple it's much easier to mix than the egg pasta. Um, just mix it up and we're aiming for a dough that is going to hold together but is not sticky. Um, with the semolina I found it's taken a little while to adjust and get used to the texture that you're going for because it changes when it's resting. Um, semolina is is what durum wheat is. It's, it's, I'm not really sure why they're referred to as different things. Um, but durum wheat is the main kind of wheat you have in pasta flour and it's very high gluten um, which is what gives it that strength because with pasta dough you do beat it up a fair amount it's not like pastry or anything where you have to treat it quite gently um, so with that that's going to hold together nicely it's a little bit wetter than I want, but that's fine because I'll just get that with a bit of bench flour. And in the flour shaker there, I just have normal all-purpose flour, um, just plain flour. And that, I don't, I don't use special flour for bench flour. Um, and with this, I'm just going to knead it 
quite repetitively like this, just folding it slightly. Kneading it slightly, folding it in on itself. Not folding it completely in half as you would with a bread flour, uh, bread dough, for example. I'm just using my thumb in there to tuck it over. And pasta flour does require a fair bit of kneading. Um, it's not just like, oh, it's mixed, now it can rest. Um, in order for the gluten to develop nicely, it needs a little bit of working. I usually aim for about seven minutes, so I'm going to carry on working this for a little bit. So you can see there, we've got an area where it's sort of folded up on itself and then underneath is really nice and smooth. And so I'm going to wrap that up in a bit of cling film. If I'm making pasta a few days in a row, or a couple of days in a row, I will keep the cling film and reuse it because it does just as good a job of keeping the air off and it's less disposable plastic waste. So that is going to go into the fridge for half an hour and then I'll be ready to shape it. So my dough has been resting and now it's quite nice and shiny. Um, and so I'm just going to be chopping off little sausages. You can see the texture there. When you slice it, it's really quite satisfying because it's, it's sort of firm, but not at all sticky. And so I'm going to be just rolling this out into a nice little sausage. And this is rolling really nicely because I tend to be quite slapdash about measurements in my cooking. Um, the dough doesn't always turn out the same. <laughs> and so then I'm just chopping and sausages into roughly even pieces. I don't go for complete consistency in size and everything because I'd say my attitude to cooking is very similar to my attitude to spinning. Now this um, I used on Instagram stories and a lot of people were very excited about it. It's literally just a small plank of wood that I have carved grooves into. Um, it's astoundingly low tech. Um, I, I used one of the tools I use for um, doing wood cuts and lino cuts, which I haven't done for a very long time because my artistic pursuits have been somewhat abandoned of late. But they just roll really nicely. So I'm just using my thumb to smear each little section across the grooves, which makes these nice little indentations. And once you get into the rhythm of it, it's quite nice and speedy. I'm just throwing them onto a tray that I have all floured up next to me here. And 
And so this is the kind of thing where the consistency of the dough is the one thing that's really important. Um, I wouldn't say it's a huge amount of skill to make these shapes. Um, you know, if you do any kind of crafts, you'll probably have an amount of dexterity. Um, and I'd say the amount needed for this is not particularly high. It takes a little while to get used to, but once you've got the hang of it, it's really fun and soothing. And I have found it brilliant throughout the winter when I've not been able to get out into the garden which is what I usually do to clear my head. Um, and so I've been making pasta obsessively. And at the moment, I for the sauces that I'm having with the pasta, I've been using mostly canned tomatoes and then whatever fresh veg we have in our veg box. But we have, one of my favourite sauces is um, just a very simple garlic and tomato and olive oil with a bit of basil. And we have a fair amount of garlic growing in the garden. And I, it's, it, it doesn't seem to be faring particularly well in the amount of wind we've got. Um, it's, they're sort of rocking about at the roots and some have fallen over. So I don't know if our entire crop is going to make it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if it does, then we will have enormous amounts of fresh garlic, which will be very exciting. We're also planning on growing tomatoes. It's a little too early to sow them now um, because although we're down in the south of England, um, we are quite exposed up on the hill here and so I think our tomatoes will need to be put out a little bit later than in down in town for example. Um, but the idea will be we've already got um, a lot of very tiny basil seedlings on the way and the idea is that we will be able to grow the source entirely from things we have in the garden. Um, and I really like that idea. It's, it's part of what I want to be doing long term is have more of how I spend my time directly related to the things that keep me alive. I, I don't know if that's a sensible way to phrase that. Um, I like growing the food that I eat. I like making the clothes that I wear. I like uh, creating the art that I put on my walls. Um, I like using my time for things rather than my money. And so where possible, eventually, I would like to have a larger space to grow things in maybe with some fibre animals, definitely with a big dye garden. And the idea would be <clears throat> not to be completely self-sufficient because I think in a modern world, like I like technology and things, so <laughs> there's, there's no way we could supply everything we needed and entirely isolate ourselves. Um, but I, I would like to have more of a hand in making the things that keep me alive. I, I like that. I, it's, it seems to give more of a sense of meaning. Part, uh, part of why I left my job, um, I used to work full time in publishing and now I work on Marina Skewer full time. Um, I left because I find spending the majority of your time doing something that has nothing to do with what keeps you alive is, is weird to me. I, I'm getting very sort of 
amateur philosopher and quite badly at it. Um, I, I do think that sitting at a desk working on projects that you probably don't care about, um, to be paid money so that you can go and do things that aren't your job so you can forget how depressing your job is, um, I'm not I'm not for it. I, I, I realise that I've got an immense amount of privilege in being able to make this decision and in being able to take a hopefully temporary um, pay cut in order to spend more time doing work that I care about and that I think is meaningful. Um, I have time to do things like this because I don't have a commute, I work from home. Um, so 45 minutes of my day spent making pasta um, to me is time well spent. It's very low cost. Um, you know, a bag of semolina costs a couple of quid. There's a little splash of olive oil in there, there's some salt. And I like that. I have, I have control over the process, which is something that is quite important to me. And that's how I try to approach everything. And it's why on a knitting podcast that is meant to be about my yarn and my design, I am making pasta because to me, it all comes from the same place. And I don't know if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you, do you consider making things by hand as a lifestyle choice? Is it something that you do for... Why, why do you make things? That's what I want to say. What is it that compels you to make things? Because I'm assuming that if you're watching this, you have some interest in crafts and working with your hands. Um, and it, it always interests me to see the different ways people come at things and how they get into crafts and making and what reasons they do it for, whether it's reasons similar to mine or completely different ones I'd love to hear. So if you have any thoughts on that, please do add them in the comments um, because that's really interesting to me. Now I'm going to carry on and make the rest of these and then I will be cooking them up in a tomato and carrot and garlic sauce. None of those things will be from our garden but in the summer, they will be.
So I can confirm that the pasta was delicious. I really encourage you, if you do enjoy a bit of cooking, to give it a go if you haven't tried before. Other than taking a bit of time, it's really very easy and loads of fun. It's really nice meditative working with your hands. Um, so that's all I've got for you today. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode and if you have please give it a thumbs up um, and consider subscribing to my channel because it'll help YouTube show this video to other people who might enjoy it. And if you want to keep up with what I'm doing between episodes you can subscribe to my newsletter, you can follow me on Instagram and I also have a brand new Facebook group where it's going to be a bit of a more casual place to hang out and chat mostly about knitting but also about bits of seasonal making as well so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in and you're on Facebook do come along and join and so in the meantime until next time bye bye